This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat. Welcome to another episode of Tao Unbound, and today we're hosting a very interesting person and a brilliant scholar, uh, Professor Eyal Gross. Yes. Welcome. Thank you so much. Professor Gross is a distinguished professor of international and constitutional law at the Tel Aviv University, University School of Law, which is one of the premier faculties of law in the country and in the world, I should say, right? It's considered to be one of the best. think so definitely I think so yeah yeah and uh, and you uh, you're very uh, visible recently in uh, in Israel in your uh, opposition to the proposed judicial overhaul and we will talk about that for sure I think that's the main reason why we wanted to hear from you uh, but before that we wanted to hear about your background how did you end up I know that you're coming from a family of prominent people legal experts right your father is a prominent attorney your mother was the legal advisor of the Ministry of Defense so you come from a massive legal background and uh, and you branched out to other areas human rights and so on so tell us about your background how did you end up doing what you're doing today yes well as you said maybe it was in the destiny that uh, with uh, my family to study law so I did and uh, but I was I I was interested in the human rights, civil rights area, even as a student. And then I, after my studies and after finishing my training as a lawyer and getting the bar license, I did my master's and doctoral studies at the Harvard Law School, uh, focusing on issues of rights and constitutional law. And, and, and then immediately after finishing my studies, I got hired by Tel Aviv University. And from the beginning, I taught both international law and constitutional law. And I think it's a very interesting combination because to a large extent, the same questions of human rights, democracy uh, come. Of course, there are also separate questions, but in the areas that I'm interested, very much the overlap between the two is very interesting because you can, for example, consider what does domestic law say about uh, freedom of speech, about uh, the right to health, and what does international law say, and, and how do the norms converge? So, uh, you know, I know I'm jumping... Uh, you know because yeah. you, you said something very interesting so just for our audience because when people say international law and I remember that from my own days as a diplomat it creates the perception as if there is a book of laws that is accepted by all countries and that's the book of international law but we know that this is not the case so what is your definition of international law well international law is as the norms that govern um, relations between states and And that also are applied internationally universally rather than the norms of a specific state but actually you know we, we know that usually they come either from treaties or from customary international law and of course the customary is a bit more complicated because how do we decide when does a certain norm become become customary international law and and sometimes it is contested obviously uh, and but then a lot of the international law is in treaties the state actually agreed upon so you are right there is no one book there is no one code but there are norms that we have to find and that's part of what makes international law interesting and and to make things even more complicated there are certain countries that took upon themselves international if not universal jurisdiction for their laws like uh, some cases the American law and other countries yeah well universal jurisdiction uh, is is again it is an accepted norm but again its implementation is contested but actually it's interesting because universal jurisdiction when you you use this term we usually means uh, in the criminal context that certain crimes are considered international crimes that every state, Can have jurisdiction upon especially crimes against humanity war crimes genocide and actually the Israeli case of Eichmann in the 60s where Israel brought to trial you know the Nazi um, um, one of the main Nazi officials Adolf Eichmann is often cited as one of the pre- uh, precedents for the implementation of this idea um, uh, that in the Israel Supreme Court I At the time Eichmann said why can you judge me here because the crime did not occur here it even occurred before Israel was founded so yes it was mentioned that Israel represents the Jewish people but actually Supreme Court put the emphasis upon the fact that the crimes are universal and every country has jurisdiction over them 
And that was cited later, for example, when they tried to bring to trial Pinochet from Chile in the UK or in Spain, actually, to extradite him to Spain over crime from the UK, to get complicated, over crimes in Chile, the UK court cited the Eichmann trial. Eventually, he was not extradited for health reasons, but they held he can be extradited and he can be, and that's the idea of universal jurisdiction, which is part of the story of international law. Now, many of our listeners and viewers are not familiar like you are with the nuances and the, you know, the, the specifics yeah. of the debate right now in Israel. Uh, can you help us and simplify the, the, what is really the main accusation or the main grievance that these people have with the Israeli judicial system? And I'm setting aside the issue of uh, that, that w- this was not even part of the campaign. So we are going moving into the Israeli constitutional law. So uh, generally, I, I would say that some sectors in the Israeli political system, um, they are, their argument is the Supreme Court has too many powers and it can decide things um, instead of the people through their elected representatives. And, the, and, and they want to change that. Uh, now... I think that we have to remember that this is, this is uh, you know, the, the first agenda, but this is the secondary agenda, which is really maybe the first agenda, is that what do they want to achieve? What, what, what disturbs them? It's not just that the court, you know, can decide some things. It's that they th- want to um, do certain things that they think the court can strike down. And I don't think that the court is as activist as they argue. I think the court actually was advanced civil rights in some areas. In other areas, for example, in issues relating to the occupied territories and security issues, it intervened, intervened very little in really extreme cases. For example, in cases, and this will help understand what they want, relating to taking over of private Palestinian land for settlements, and especially when it was by settlers themselves without even the Israeli government authorizing it. And and so for them, even this little intervention is too much. So, but what you're saying is actually very interesting. Which and I and I'm sure that many of our listeners will be surprised to hear what you're saying. Actually, is that the very Supreme Court that they're targeting served actually as a shield that protected many of the policies that this government supports. Very much, the Supreme Court never intervened in the question of settlements themselves. Although in international law, they accepted understanding by most scholars and by the International Court of Justice is that the Israeli settlements are illegal because the Geneva Conventions, which Israel is a member of, does not allow to transfer civilian population of the occupying power into occupied territory. So are they shooting themselves? It did not the intervene in home demolition, very rarely, in spite of what you may, some people argue, actually in the most majority. It did not intervene in so many issues. It intervened in very few cases. Um, uh, and 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 I think that uh, I, I by the way I think it should have intervened more in some cases. I understand the political limits of the court and it cannot replace the politics, but I think in some issues it could have done more. Now, so I think that we have to understand that the current uh, 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 idea to reform the ju- so-called reform the judicial system, and you know, which really means to restrict the power of the court to take over the judicial appointments, so the coalition can appoint the judges. Its purpose is to create a government which will have no restrictions over its power, an unlimited government. And and the idea of limited government is as old as the idea of democracy, right? That the government of hundreds of years, that government's power must be limited. And in Israel, we have to remember, we don't have a real separation of powers in the sense of, like in the U.S., the president is elected separately and he can veto legislation. There are two houses of uh, of Congress which can balance out each other sometimes. In Europe, they, they, most countries are members of either the European Court of Justice or the European Court of Human Rights or both. In Israel, the checks and balances are very few because we have a parliamentary system where the coalition government really has the power both over the executive and the legislature because they have a majority in the parliament. That's why they get the, the trust, of the, the confidence of the... And, and, and we, don't, we, we don't have, we, uh, you know, a bicameral system. The president is just, uh, you know, has only ceremonial roles. Um, so the prime minister and the government really control the parliament, and the only checks we have is, is, is really the only effective check we have is the Supreme Court, and they want to restrict it. And I think there are three interests here that exist. 
One is the interest of the more extreme right, extreme religious, even I would say messianic part of the, of the coalition, that they want, for example, again, to be able to settle in the occupied territories without any restriction, even if it means taking private Palestinian lands without the Supreme Court intervening. They also don't like the Supreme Court's liberal cases on LGBT rights, on women's rights, on asylum seekers' rights, anything that for them undermines their, their vision of a Jewish state, which is built upon uh, very conservative Jewish uh, uh, traditions, upon Jewish supremacy, upon... Yeah, so, so I think that's one interest. You have the second interest, the ultra-Orthodox parties, which are mostly interested in... Uh, uh, in one issue, which is a Supreme Court judgment that said that the law that gives um, uh, religious seminary, yeshiva students, uh, ultra-Orthodox one, um, exemption for military service discriminates versus other which have to go to the military and has to be changed. So they are mostly want a way to override or overcome that. And then there are the personal interest of uh, the prime minister, Mr. Netanyahu, who is under criminal trial himself, and uh, for this reason, he's not so fond of the legal system at the moment. And um, so we have those three interests uh, together. Um, uh, and, and unlike previous coalitions with Netanyahu's prime minister, uh, there are many changes, but a major change that in the past, he always uh, had some coalition parties, uh, members in his coalition from the center, and they refused to support any such changes. By the way, he himself objected to any such changes before. Now, with his current coalition partners, and maybe I cannot uh, read his mind, but maybe with his own criminal trial going on, situation is different. So now they went out with this huge program, which would mean the coalition would appoint the judges rather than a balanced committee. Uh, decision of Supreme Court could be overridden. Uh, the judicial review will be limited. Now, they didn't manage to pass this bleach of legislation because the opposition was so huge, the demonstrations, the protests, the pressures. But I think they are trying to pass it in a piecemeal way, uh, what we call the salami method, you know, piece by piece, slowly. Uh, and I think that, uh, um, as you said, I was <laughs> heard a lot because suddenly my area of constitutional law became very popular. Everyone now wants to hear about constitutional law and things that like... Uh, override clause, judicial review, uh, uh, reasonableness uh, doctrine, suddenly, instead of something just for the expert, everyone right. is interested in it. So, so let's talk a little bit about big picture issues. Um, let's adopt the more optimistic view, which says that uh, this crisis also represents an opportunity. And the opportunity is to come out of it stronger and better. Let's assume that, just for the sake of argument. In your view, what needs to happen in order for Israel to emerge out of this crisis stronger and better? Well, I think that um, we do see in public opinion polls that there is no support for those plans. We do see in public opinion points or polls that the coalition is doing very badly in the polls and that if elections were held today, to the extent that the polls are genuine uh, or, I mean, uh, can predict things, uh, the coalition would, would lose. Uh, so I think um, uh, uh, not taking a partisan position, but I think that, that uh, we have to be vigilant, anyone who opposes those changes, because they think this wants to destroy the independence of the court, the idea of a limited government, any democratic ideas. You have to be vigilant because, the, 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 because there's a real risk that the government will continue and try and, and do those changes slowly, but also that they'll do it by other means because we are talking a lot about the constitutional changes, but we also see all sort of changes um, uh, even through appointments and through uh, different... Uh, ba I mean, just now, for example, they want to fire the head of the authority overlooking... Um, government-owned corporations, because she presented some independent opinion that the Minister of Charge did not like. We know that they may want to, re to fire the Attorney General. So I think there is a, the, the, there is a term uh, called constitutional capture. When you try to capture all the institutions of the state, so there would no be, not be checks and balances. And I think we see an attempt to do that. So one part of the attempt is the attack on the Supreme Court, but that's not the only part. So we really have to be vigilant. And I think that the public became very aware, which is good. 
I think in order to be to be stronger, uh, come out of the stronger and reinforce democracy in Israel, we also have to look at the root causes. Uh, there is no way to avoid that. We have to understand um, what is the underlying agenda, and we have to understand. And um, I know that some people say we should wait for this issue. This is not the time. But for me, I think we have to understand that. You cannot have this, we could not continue with this fantasy that we can have a long-term occupation which undermines democracy because it rules millions of people against their will and then have democracy within the 1967 borders of Israel. Because actually the wish to control in the West Bank without any limits and to settle everywhere regardless of Palestinian rights is, from, in my view, a major driver of this reform attempt. And also... We have seen now, for example, and people are really getting worried about um, uh, the police getting more violent toward demonstrators and using all sorts of measures against them. And, and here exactly you see the things that, that we already have seen in the occupied territories, um, violence against Palestinian demonstrators, measures which overuse of force, etc. So I think that, uh, from in my view, and I know not everyone shares this view, if we want to come out, we have to look at the root issues and we have to understand that um, the problem with democracy did not just start now. What's happening now is, is of course, trying to make things worse, but actually we have underlying problems that we have to deal with to create a real democratic country, uh, which would mean real equality for everyone and would also mean to... To, to try and solve this issue, which of course is not right. easy, but to understand that we cannot continue like we did before and things we will right, just be right. democratic. Let me, let me try and present this question from a different angle to you. Uh, um, here's my theory, and tell me what you think about that. So I, I think that we are facing this constitutional crisis, although we don't have a written constitution, because of the failure, the ongoing failure, of leaders from the early days of the state until this very day to present to the Israeli public a unifying, galvanizing vision that is essentially civilian, that goes beyond the need to survive militarily. So in my, in my, in my theory, the reason why we are facing this moment in our history is because we never had any other agenda but survivability. And so military became the defining element and you mentioned the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but it's not just that. It's also the issue with Iran. It's the issue with the Arabs and so on and so forth. There's, a, there's always some security concern which overrides everything else, right? We, we are, we're now discovering that this is also the main reason why we not, don't, never got the visa waiver from the Americans. It turns out, just read about it yesterday, it has nothing to do with the Americans. It was us all those years who didn't make that happen because of security concerns. So what are the chances we will come out of this with a civilian vision for a, you know, a Western-style, healthy, robust democracy? Look, you, you say this, and I remember that in 2011, there were the big social protests. At the same time, there was the Occupy protest in other countries. So there was this moment which I think gave a lot of people hope. And, and, and then, just as you say... Netanyahu, who was also prime minister then, said, well, I know there's a housing issue, but I have to deal with what he called life itself, the Iranian threat, right? So he used the security issue to say, okay, I understand you're protesting about the housing issue, but I have to deal with saving our lives. So yes, this emergency discourse, the security discourse takes over. Uh, you're asking a good question, and I think it's, you know, it's a difficult one because if you see, if you notice, um, the protest, there is a lot of the, uh, a major part of the protest is by veterans of the army or reservists of the army. And actually some of them say, we will not go to serve in the army now uh, for our reserve duty, even pilots and other intelligence people, because, and different elite units, because if this happens, if those reforms happen, because we don't want to serve a country which is not a democracy. So I'm not sure what to take, because on one hand you could say, look, finally they're saying something else comes before the security agenda. We will not uh, agree to go to the army, notwithstanding all security arguments, be if, because of the democracy issues. So that can be optimistic for your vision. On the other hand, you can say, look how much of the discourse against this, uh, I call it like, you know, a constitutional coup d'etat or whatever, not reform, uh, 
how much of it is still within the security discourse that the people who serve in the army play such a big role in the protest? So does that mean we are reinforcing the security discourse or we are weakening it because they say, so I'm still not sure, you know, the jury is still out about that. Right, right, right. And that's, and, and I think you're, you're, you're uh, um, pointing to a very interesting uh, dilemma um, of, of uh, and, and by the way, and I think that, uh, that, you know, we need to go back to Herzl and read what, read more about Herzl's vision and what kind of Jewish state he had in mind. You know, he talked about rights in late 19th century. Yeah. He spoke about a place where women will have a right to vote, and he did not even envision a military because he thought Israel will be protected by the global powers of the time. So he was a, he was a true uh, humanist, and he was a true universalist. And I think that uh, Zionism always and Judaism always existed on this, you know, on the scale between universalism and Yeah. And particularism. Look, even if you, you mentioned Herzl, if you look at the Israel Declaration of Independence from 1948, which says that Israel will guarantee equal rights, equal social and political rights, and will develop the country for the sake of all its residents, not just the Jewish ones. And I always do an exercise with my students in class. I ask, do you think this can pass today in the parliament? And I'm not talking about this parliament now, which is the most right-wing one, even before, right? Right, and the nation. The nation-state law was 2018. And the nation-state law exactly is the opposite of the Declaration of Independence because it says in Article 7, the government will develop for Jews. The Declaration of Independence said will develop... Now, I'm not saying the Declaration of Independence is perfect, but just note the contrast where it says it developed for all the residents of the country and nation-state law from, uh, says developed for Jews. So, so let's... It's fascinating. What you're talking about is fascinating. Let's talk about the historical context, okay? Because... We do know that the, that the Proclamation of Independence was heavily influenced by the creation of the United Nations. The United Nations was created as a result of the trauma of World War II. And the UN Charter is very optimistic, very progressive. And our Proclamation of Independence actually even makes reference yeah. to the UN Charter. Okay, so that was the context then. Yeah. And, What and changed? 48 is, is a year also of the Israel Declaration of Independence, but also of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted by the UN. Right. So now, what's happening all over the world that we have this wave of populism? Okay, I think there are a few answers here. Um, specifically, uh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the most recent challenges and then I'll go a bit, a bit further back. So the most recent challenges globally, I think, Uh, we, we talk a lot about how the rise of populism is a result of a uh, financial crisis, uh, which started with the credit crunch, and, we, 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 and, how, um, uh, and also the migration crisis and refugee crisis. So we have seen those two issues. And when that happens, uh, it creates a lot of ground for the populist leaders to, to work, right? Because, they, because people feel afraid, people economically feel insecure. Migration and refugee... It's very easy to blame them and say, you are threatened because we are getting those migrations, migrants or those refugees. And, 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 to, and, and when people feel financially insecure and people feel there are more refugees and more migrants coming or seeking to come, it's very easy for those populist leaders to come and say, hey, we are really going to take care of you because the government doesn't take care of you. Look how your financial situation is bad. Look how all those migrants are coming. And you've seen it with Trump. You've seen it with Brexit. You've seen it in other countries. And then it's very easy for them to say, those liberal parties, they just care for the migrants, for the refugees, for the minorities, for the LGBT. They don't really care for you, the, the small person who needs a job. Now, I'll tell you something. Uh, we have to listen to the populism because the populism comes because there is a vacuum. And here I'm going to go back to the 80s and say, Remember that promise of 48? I said that the Israeli Declaration of Independence talked about equal, and I purposely, purposely said it, political and social rights. Shivyon zchuyot chavrati ve'medini in Hebrew. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the same. It talked about the human rights, but it also talked about the social rights, about everyone's right to adequate standard of living, including health care, education, etc. Now, I think this promise was not fulfilled, and especially from the 80s, when... 
all the welfare ideas of post-World War II were replaced with a new liberal idea that the state should cut the public expense, etc. And those ideas, so I think that we also have to ask, uh, did we neglect this post-World War II welfare state idea and, and let the new liberal idea, idea take over? And even when labor parties or left parties, look at Clinton, look at Rabin in Israel, look at Tony Blair, with all the good things you can say about them, when they came to power in the 90s, they didn't try to undo the new liberal agenda of the 80s. They, to a large extent, with some modifications, but to a large extent, continue with it. So and, actually, and why do you think that happened? Uh, ideology, which people have interest to advance, you know, that's a big, big political question. But, but the point I want to say is that I think that those who want to fight for democracy have to offer a vision which is not only about uh, protecting the Supreme Court. It's also, in my view, about how will we make sure that we tell all the citizens that democracy works for you. That the people who don't have a job, the people that have a low income, so how do we actually bring back the promise of the welfare state? And I think that we don't talk enough about it. And I, and I think that when we don't talk enough and we don't really show the people and we don't really act in this regard, then people feel, okay, economically I'm not doing so well or um, I'm afraid of migrants. Now in Israel, it's a bit of a different story because of the uh, security fears, but, but it, in a way it's not that different. It, it, there are some differences. Do, do you believe you can, you can um, approach groups that oppose uh, your beliefs uh, with this message? Uh, and I, you know, in theory, it sounds, it sounds like the right thing to do, to tell even the ultra-Orthodox, listen, democracy is good for you. I personally know a few people that are ultra-Orthodox that actually told me that, that they understand that democracy is actually good for them. It protects them. Do, do you think it's possible in today's political climate? I think everything is very polarized and it's hard, but I will tell you, I think that the, uh, contrary to what sometimes what you hear, I don't think the ultra-orthodox uh, is a main issue here. It is an important issue, but I think that you can see, even if you look at the numbers, that those ultra-nationalists, they are driving this agenda more than the ultra-orthodox, which are, some yeah. of them are even, the Minister of Justice, right. who is pushing this agenda is secular. Um, the uh, members of parliament like Mr. Rothman who are pushing this agenda, who is the chair of the Knesset committee who deals with those issues. I mean, he's more than orthodox. And I think the ultra-orthodox, uh, I think, by the way, there could be a solution. You can find a solution of a, a universal uh, mo mechanism of exemption for military service uh, based on people, like if they're pacifist or other things. Um, and, and you can integrate the issue of the exemption for ultra-orthodox within that. And then cause people and explain to people that it's a universal thing about issues of faith, which are not have to be the ultra orthodox ones. You can you can find maybe solutions there. I, I think that you can find solution for that. And I think that uh, uh, um, uh, that's not the main driver at the moment. It is one of the drivers, but I think alone the ultra orthodox would not be able to push this attempt at reform. Professor Gross, uh, this is fascinating. I, I mean, I could talk to you for hours, and but, but, but we're running out of time. One last question. Are you optimistic? Um, if I'm, I think that one a person cannot live without hope. So I think you always have to have hope that things will be better. I don't know if I'm optimistic, um, um, but I think that I, I, I always have this hope and this some kind of faith that, that things will will get better and that uh, you know reason and and communication can help maybe i'm naive but i'm living with this hope because i think otherwise uh, i think i just heard someone said last week uh, that um, to be desperate is not an agenda and i agree well and we couldn't agree more we couldn't agree yeah. more thank you so much for helping us to make sense out of what's happening out there and uh, for educating us and, and we hope to uh, have you again here in this podcast. Thank you for having me. And to our listeners and viewers, until our next episode, goodbye from Tel Aviv. Bye-bye. 